Hey, this is Levi coming to you from the Schuler Performing Arts Center in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We're out in the middle of our Northwest Skull Church autumn tour that's going through Washington and Idaho and Montana. We're close to the, the halfway point, or I guess two out of six, uh, but we have seen God do amazing things. Just literally moments ago, we saw in this packed auditorium, uh, we saw people uh, streaming out of their seats, flooding down these aisles, literally this, this whole front area, and then the, the aisles and this aisle in the middle filled all the way to the back and, and looking out into the eyes of, of people just crying through their mascara, all giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Uh, unbelievable and amazing. And we still have dates to come in Boise and in Great Falls and in Butte. And we're believing that God is going to do great things. You can check out SkullChurch.com and be a part of the webcast for each of these events and tweet out the link and, and see what God would do. But while we're on this tour, a good friend of the Fresh Life House, Pastor Carl Lentz from Hillsong Church, New York City, an explosive move of God taking place in the middle of Manhattan and onto New Jersey and the influence and the impact that God has has on the, the life of, uh, the anointing on the life of Pastor Carl and his wife, Laura, is just amazing. I'm, I'm so grateful, and, and I just want to say how, how honored I am to, to even know uh, to these two fine leaders and, and just to have been on the receiving end of, of their love, not only to see what God does when they're preaching a message, that's impressive, but, but the way they live their lives and are raising their kids and, and just want people to know Jesus and, and believe God for, for greater days in the midst of trial. Uh, I'm so excited that you're about to hear this message on this archive that he preached at Fresh Life Church, and uh, God bless you very much. Such an honor to be at Fresh Life. We have um, multiple campuses, Billings, Whitefish, Kalispell, Bozeman, Missoula. Boom! Oh, man, I was praying I'd get that right. And wherever you find uh, yourself hearing this message, we love you. It's the right Sunday to be in church. I absolutely love your church. I love uh, your pastors up here in the front row. And I can barely look at them or talk without, like, bawling my eyes out. I never cry. I'm not an emotional guy. That's a joke. But, you know... I don't want to see how a Christian reacts when they win. I want to see how a Christian responds when life throws you a loss or something disappointing. I believe that's the measure of a Christian. And I uh, turn to my friend. I've got two friends here with me, Kevin and Adam. Uh, one is a you know, world-class ping pong player. And um, <laughs> I just, I, I told him as you guys were worshiping, I said, y'all worship the same way. Oh, the bummer. My eyes are sweating. You worship the same way that Sunday that your daughter went to be with Jesus that you worship right now. And I think that's the measure of a Christian. I think that when you can sit under leadership like that, um, it's an honor and it's a special thing. And I know uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be their friend. And I think they're worthy of all the honor you can give them. So if you love your pastors, all the other campuses right now, we're cheering for your pastors. There's nobody like them. Thank you for that. But I really love Montana. I was talking to Sam, some of the awesome guys that have been hanging out with us. And um, they say New York City is dangerous, and I believe that. <laughs> but uh, I was like, just being funny, I was like, yo, seen any bears lately? He's like, yeah, we had a couple sightings on Main Street. That's not normal. It's not normal to have bear sightings in the places that you inhabit. I would rather deal with a drug dealer or a gang than I would a wild animal in the streets of Montana. So I'm nervous. Every time I come to Montana, I love it, but I'm looking over my shoulder. Is there, is there moose? Is there bears? Did you bring a Bible? I'm going to preach uh, something near and dear to my heart, and I pray it's a blessing to you. Um, I love this church, and the best thing about it is you can come as you are, not come as you should be. So if you're brand new here, any of our campuses, you found the right place. This church is better because you're in it. Don't be a visitor. This place should be home. I had a friend one time say to me, they're like, I don't go to church. Because there's hypocrites in church. I said, we got a seat for you too. <laughs> Churches shouldn't be perfect because I wouldn't fit in. Either would you. They should just be healthy. And this place is that. And I pray that I can add. But Levi came and preached at our church in New York City. And he was unbelievable. I don't, I don't necessarily approve of the way that he looks with the tattoos and everything. But um, <laughs> he was just phenomenal. People are still asking, like, hey, great message, Carl. When's Levi coming back? I'm, that's frustrating. I'm like, Levi loves you enough to come once in a couple of months. I love you, you know, so much. I'm here every week. 
Okay, let's go to, uh, the struggle is real. John chapter 14. And I'm looking for my clock. Where is it, Levi? Okay, it's going up. What a bummer. 45 minutes. He told me this is an old Baptist service, so I can just preach as long as I want. And people will come and go. So. How many single people do we have here tonight? All right, how many married people? All right, Ooh, wow. All the single people, I like to do this at our church. I'll just throw this out there real quick. Once a week, we give a church pickup line. So if you're here, if you're watching online, just try this. Maybe grab your Bible at some point and uh, try to sit next to somebody. You've been church stalking for a while. Church stalking is where you just show up next to that person randomly at every service. Like, oh, here we are again. Hey. And uh, this is my classic one. Maybe next time I'll come, I'll bring something new, but I don't have to when this one's this good. You want to look at somebody you like in church. And you want to say, hey. My, my Bible's incomplete because I'm in the book of Numbers and yours isn't in there. John chapter 14. This is Jesus talking. And if you've ever been confused or if you've ever been wondering what to do in life or how to live your life, uh, Jesus is the right doctor to see. And he's explaining all kinds of stuff to the guys he loves the most. And he says this powerful thing in John 14 that I love. He says, don't let this throw you. And he had just talked about how he was going to be murdered and there was going to be all kinds of drama. And he says, don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? So trust me. There's plenty of room for you in my father's house. I love that. For all the churches that don't want to grow and they want to shut their doors, I'm grateful that Fresh Life is about making room because there is room for everybody in Montana, no matter where you come from, no matter how much money you do or don't have, whether you have identity or not, this church is for you. There's room in this house. Can I get an amen? If that weren't so, I, would have told you, I wouldn't have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you. And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'm going to come back and get you so you can live where I live. And you already know the road that I'm taking. And Thomas said, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? Have you ever felt like that? Read the Bible. You're like, what do you mean, God? You're not alone. Jesus said, I am the road. I am the truth. And I am the life. Could just stop right there. He said, nobody gets to the Father apart from me. Think about this statement. I'm going to read it one more time. He said, I am the road, I am the truth, and I am the life. In an age that is preaching all roads lead to heaven, wrong. In a universalistic spiritual society where people are like, you do what works for you, and I'm going to do what works for me, and somehow we're going to meet at the same place. Jesus said, all the confusion is over. I am the road, I am the map, I am the way. I've called this message tonight, Always, Only Jesus. That's all I got. Bow your head. <laughs> Always, Only Jesus. Nothing else, nothing more, no addition, no need to add to it like Hollywood likes to do with Christian movies nowadays. Always, Only Jesus. Look at somebody and say, Always, Only Jesus. Be even more relevant and say, Hashtag, Always, Only Jesus. Have you ever, um, you know, went on a trip and uh, got to the destination and realized you had everything except for the one thing you needed? Like you packed everything. You guys probably hike a lot in Montana. I hike all the time. Hike my way to a spa. I'm not ashamed of that. <laughs> Where you get to a trip and you realize I missed the one thing. Or like you get on a plane, you got all your movies downloaded, you got your phone, but you forget a charger. You missed the one thing, or maybe you're single and you're on a date, and you have a great date, but you forgot your wallet, so you couldn't pick up the tab. Some guys are like, I don't pick up a tab anyway. That's why you're single. <laughs> Where you like have everything but the one thing. You know, we recently were going to take my little daughter, Charlie, overseas to go see her uh, great-grandma before she passed away. And uh, we had been pumping her up, as you do with your daughters, you know, to go on a trip. And she was super pumped for months and months. A uh, note to new parents, don't ever tell your children you're going on a trip until the moment you're walking out the door. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to deal with that little person. Is, is it time? No, we're leaving next year. So my daughter, Charlie, super pumped to go. Couldn't have been more excited. We get to the airport. And me and Laura walk up to go check in for our flights. And we hand our passports. We hand them Charlie's passport. And the lady looks at me, and she's like, sir, um, always bad when any TSA airline people want you to come closer. She's like, oh, I don't know how to tell you this, but your daughter's passport is expired. And I was like, no, that, 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 that can't be the case. 
it can't be the case because my wife, you know, when couples are fighting, when they speak about their spouse, like they're not there, but they're right there. My wife would never let that happen because that's her responsibility. You smile as if that's going to cover it. It's her responsibility. And there's no way that we would plan all this with an expired passport. My wife's like, ha ha, that's funny. Because there's no way my husband would let us be in this position because it's also his responsibility. We're having a marital moment. And we got down to it where we realized there's nothing this lady could do. I'm like, ma'am, there's nothing you can do. I'm asking like a TSA lady to like finagle the one thing you need to get into a country. It's not going to happen. And, uh, and I was like, we, we can't go. And I was like, Laura, you go and, and see your family. And I'm going to tell Charlie. I'll break the news to her about the fact that she can't go. So I sat Charlie down and I said, babe, I've got good news and I've got bad news. You know, uh, the bad news is that um, your passport has expired. I don't know how to explain it to you that you'll understand, but it just basically means that we can't go on the trip anymore, and I'm not going to go with I'm not gonna go with mom. I'm going to walk home with you, and I'm going to get you anything you want. I'm going to buy you a pony, anything to erase this memory. And she looks at me, and her little lip starts to quiver, and she goes, Dad, it's okay. And I was like, honey, give me a second. I'm going to go outside, and I'm going to light myself on fire, and I'm going to come back in. And I just remember looking at her, walking out, going, we had everything. We had her bag packed. We had everything she needed, but one line on one passport stopped us from our entire trip. As is our world, where people are accumulating everything they could possibly think that they need. They're searching high and low and getting all the stuff, but they are missing the one thing. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm happy to miss out on the many things as long as I have the one thing that is a relationship with Jesus. It's only Jesus. We don't have to go search for our healer. We have him in Jesus. We don't have to go get an award so that we know our worth. We have it in Jesus. Always, only Jesus. I just wanted to encourage a few people tonight. There's a good chance that I could fall right off the stage. I want to encourage a few people here in the age of cool church that you are in a true church. This thing is built on Jesus. If you're in here and you don't have much, maybe you're thinking, I don't know, I'm looking around my life and all I have is Jesus. Always only Jesus plus nothing is better than everything minus him. Always only Jesus. Can, I, can you write something down? I got a couple notes. I put this together, you know, today just praying and seeking God about this amazing church and what I could leave with you. So I kind of amalgamated, which is a great word couple different weeks in one. So you can just pick and choose what you like. If you don't like it, email Levi. <laughs> Write this down. The only way to get the only thing that matters in this life, which is revelation, is through personal dedication and commitment. Oh, this is going to encourage somebody. The only way to get the only thing that matters in this life, which is revelation, is through personal commitment and personal devotion. Not going to church. Not getting the latest podcast. Think about this. Revelation, if you're new to Fresh Life Church, revelation is a fancy word for God spoke to you. Revelation is what God says. Information is what people say. There's a lot of information getting in church, but there's not a lot of revelation outside of it. So you have a lot of churches that are speaking dead things to dead people. But the only way to get the only thing that matters, revelation, is through personal commitment to Jesus. This is awesome because if you're looking to grow, you're no longer going to come in and say, what's Levi got for me this Sunday? I don't know what this is. <laughs> or it's not about what I'm going to go do outside of it. It's you and Jesus. Always only Jesus. And here's where we get it from. I'm going to read you one more scripture for right now. Then we're going to read about eight more. But this is in Matthew. I just want to show you this because it's going to encourage somebody that you have the right to control your own spiritual growth. We live in a church world where churches are trying to dictate how people can grow. Like the man of God has a direct line to God and you don't. What I love about Jesus is he saved the best for him and you. For me and him. Outside of church. Church is great if you have a relationship with Jesus outside of it. And he said something awesome. He said this. Are you tired, Montana? I added that. Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you're going to recover your life. I'm going to show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you're going to learn how to live freely and lightly. Now, if you've never heard that, 
This can be one of those verses that you just read. I remember reading it with a friend who's down here. And we sat there and we thought, oh my gosh, this is easy. This is amazing. Think about what Jesus was trying to communicate to people. If you want to know me, all I want you to do is walk with me. He didn't say go to church. He didn't say go do all the right things. He said the one thing I want from the people that I love and the people that profess to love me is I want to walk with you. You can get information in school. You can get information on a podcast. But if you want to walk with God, if you want to get closer to Jesus, he said I'm saving the best for me and you. I actually want to know you. You get to walk with God. And here's why this is such a problem. Religion is I show up. And I talk to God and I leave. It's like something that I do. A relationship with Jesus, it's something that you are. So religion is you come to church and you go live your life. Jesus said, no, I don't want that. I want you to walk with me. I want you to roll with me. I want you to hang out with me. I want to get to know you better. I mean, you can't fake a walk. If you don't really like somebody, you go have coffee with them. Because you can leave at any time. But if you commit to a walk with somebody... What if I told you that our world struggles with this concept that God loves you so much he wants to have the most intimate, special part of you and him be reserved for just you and him? You can get a lot of great stuff in church, but the best spiritual growth times for you will not be with Levi and Jenny around. It'll be between you and God somewhere else where you're walking with God and you walk into church like, wow! That's why our church back home is awesome. It's not because we have great leaders. It's because people are walking with Jesus, so they're coming in hungry and ready. When you're starving, Skittles is like a full-course meal. But what happens in church life is people aren't walking with Jesus, so they come into church. They got nothing inside of them. They have nothing fresh brewing in their life, so they come in trying to be entertained, trying to be inspired from human, normal people, when really Jesus wanted that role to be reserved for himself. Write this down. This might help you. Distance creates distortion. So you bridge the gap through communication. This is going to help somebody. Distance creates distortion. So we bridge the gap through communication. Have you ever seen something that's really far away and you don't really know what it is? You're like, is that a McDonald's or is that a hospital? Is that you can't really tell. You can only tell when you get closer. That's why it's a bad idea to fall in love with a club. Is she good looking? And the lights come on. You're like, ah! You don't have clubs in Montana? People are trying to act. Maybe you know somebody who knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so here's what happens with Christians all the time. They will come into church and they will have a relationship with God, but it's distant. And they have no interaction with God whatsoever. So it begins to get really, really distorted because they don't know, does God love me? Does he not? Is he for me, not against me? I don't really know. So when they go through a tough time, they can't really tell what's for them and what's not for them. The only way you're going to bridge that gap is through communication with God. So my question for you, Fresh Life leaders, is this. What is your communication rhythm? What's your rhythm? Because Jesus said, I want you to learn my rhythm. Your rhythm is going to be different than my rhythm. But you know how you speak to the streets of Montana? They come across a lot of Fresh Lifers. Is that what you call? Stephen Furtick calls them elevators. I figured you'd be a Fresh Lifer. When they walk by people like you, are like, wow, they have a rhythm with God. It seems like they're in sync with heaven, not because the church is awesome, because people actually know God. What is your rhythm? When do you spend time with God? What do you pray about? What do you talk about? What is your rhythm? The moment you find your rhythm with God, things get really good. I had no idea about rhythm. When I got saved, I thought everybody had to do the same thing. We had to pray. I was in the quiet time generation. Anybody who was raised in that kind of church where they don't care if you're robbing banks as long as you had your 15-minute quiet time. And I hated that. So when I got saved, I was like, I just did the most spiritual thing I could think of. I was like, how I'm going to get closer to Jesus, I'm going to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I was dead by, like, Deuteronomy. I'm like, I can't understand this. I'll try Rick Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. That's a great book. You know, it's the only Bible, it's the only book besides the Bible that was, like, you know, the best best bestseller of all time. Uh, Purpose Driven Failure. Couldn't get through chapter two. I'm just not good at that. Try the one-year Bible. By February, I'm lost again. And my dad could see my frustration. He said, Carl, why don't you find your rhythm? I was like, I can do that? He's like, yeah, religion gives you a set of rules. Jesus wants to go on a walk. So he's like, why don't you take a verse and just start to meditate on it, start to pray about it. It's going to be different than mine. The only thing that needs to be the same is that there is a time and there is a place. But if you want to see this church grow and you want to see your life grow, ask yourself, what is my rhythm with God? 
Because that's the best way for you to understand this. Don't let there be any distance between you and heaven. Don't wait till church to get your life right and to feel free again. Don't let this be the only time you worship. Because when you understand God is not confined to these walls, the church exists to break down the walls, not build them. God is not supposed to be contained within movie theaters and big church buildings. The whole point of Jesus is that I came to break all that stuff down. Do you have a rhythm? Maybe this will help you. I'll give you like a, um, a, a, a tip. Well, my thing is I pray everywhere I go. And, and New York can get away with this because everybody looks crazy. So you can pray on the subway, you can speak in tongues, and the next person is just as weird, so it doesn't matter. I don't know what yours is, but try something this week that's different than you've ever done. Maybe try to find a special place in a special time and give God that moment of your life and watch how much more fun it is to open up the Bible when you feel like you're not visiting it, like it's a road map. It's actually something that's a part of you. You can even try this. I, I call it the social media swap. This is good for anybody who checks their phone. New Yorkers apparently check their phone over 150 times a day. My challenge would be if you use your phone a lot, I know I'm a super simple, practical preacher. Don't judge me. I don't have anything big theological. This is it. When you go to your phone, normally to go to social media, I would challenge you put a scripture or put something that matters of spiritual weight on your phone so every time, 150 times a day, you're looking at the Bible. So if you're looking to go make that call, you shouldn't call it. The call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, maybe I won't go. Right. Well, if you're thinking you can't get through the day, you put Philippians 4 on there, and it says, I can do all things through before you know it. You're getting a scripture in your system. You're getting God's words in your heart. Before you know it, it changes everything. I put my wife's name in my phone, by the way. I took out Laura Lent, and I put the woman I love the most. So every time she calls me, if we're fighting or if I'm mad, I'm like, oh, it's the woman I love the most again. Hey, babe, how you doing? It's amazing. Why? Seeing his words changes your world. Keep in mind, I haven't talked about church yet. Think about it. I have a friend I put on his rear view mirror, iron sharpens iron. So every time he looks up at that mirror and looks back in his back seat, there better be friends back there that are making you better. What can you do when you leave here as your Fresh Life Church goes into a whole new dimension of God giving you favor to make sure that you are walking with Jesus? It can't be up to the leadership of this church. Every man, every woman that has taken on the mantle of bringing Jesus to Montana and beyond. How's your rhythm? How's your connection to God? It's going to change everything about you and your life. I remember for me when I first got saved, I remember going through a moment where I felt distant from God. You ever felt like that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Really? Four people? Let's just pretend you know somebody who's ever been there. And I remember feeling myself wanting to turn around. It was before I had a lot of the Word in me. And we've gotten away from the Word, by the way. I do believe our generation is the most biblically illiterate one we have. Because Christianity takes work. You've got to get into this. It's free and it's easy, but it's all up to you. And I remember not knowing a lot of the Bible. And I remember going to church. And within like a two-month span, I had lost every friend that I had. Didn't know anybody was going out, you know, with my parents all the time. I remember thinking, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can spend another Valentine's Day with mom and dad. I gave my life to you, but I was thinking it was going to get better. And I remember making a decision that I cannot do this anymore. So I'm going to walk away from God. And I went home in my little house in Virginia Beach, little apartment, and my sisters had the audacity to break into my house and put scriptures everywhere I could look. The audacity of sisters that love God and their brother. I remember being so mad, I would go into the the food, get some food, I am the bread of life, Uh, whatever. I remember looking in the mirror thinking, I can't do this. And on tooth with toothpaste writing, Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. I'm like, whatever. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm going to leave and I'm going to go back to my old life. And there was Jeremiah 29 on the door handle. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I'm like, forget it. I'm going to go sleep this off. And I remember putting my head on the pillow, hearing paper underneath my pillow. I pick it up, and there's this promise from God. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm thinking, I cannot run. Looking at his words changed my world. Only Jesus can take you where you want to go. Only Jesus can fill some of these voids in your heart. So my challenge as one of your uncles of the house I'm not a guest speaker. I'm just that weird guy from New York who shows up at all the meals, eats and leaves. Where's your relationship with Jesus at today? How well do you know him? It's not enough to go to a church that worships. Do you worship? 
It's not enough to go sit under a Bible teacher. Are you a Bible student? Can you imagine a world of people that go to church but live their faith? Big difference. I'm going to give you two more thoughts, and then we're going to pray. Is that okay? I actually got plenty of time. Hour and a half. We're right on schedule. Cheers. <laughs> Biggest indicator of how much influence Jesus Christ has in your life, you know what it is? How well you love people. Oh, this is a good one. If you want to know how to, I guess, love, you got to know who is love. So as a pastor, I know for me, I don't, you know, gauge how spiritual people are because a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, God's my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. I don't gauge it by how often you go to church. I don't gauge it by how often you do spiritual things. I want to know how well you love people. That's how you know if you're truly following Jesus. That's why I do not understand mean, nasty, critical, blogging Christians. Because the moment you get around Jesus, I find it hard when I meet people who say they pray a lot, but they're mean. Because I'm often like, who are you praying to in that weird prayer closet? Because when I pray and I get around the forgiver of all sin, the, 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 I guess the embodiment of grace in a person, which was Jesus, the moment I get in God's presence and I start to pray and I start to thank him for what he's done in my life, the last thing I'm thinking about when I leave my prayer time is holding a grudge against somebody else. If you want to know today, you want to gauge your spirituality, ask yourself, how well do you love people? That's how you gauge whether God is doing something in your life. How do you love those that cannot love you back? How do you love those that slander you when you're not looking? How do you treat those people that can never do anything for you? I don't gauge my spirituality by how many times I go to church. I gauge how much influence Jesus has in my life by how I handle myself in traffic. What happens to Christians in traffic? I'll give you an example. I guess for me, we all have areas that are tougher to have always only Jesus influence than others. And I know for me, my final frontier as a Christian man, I think, was the basketball court. Like, I, I could be a great Christian, treat people well, but the moment I started playing basketball again, I remember thinking, pastor hat comes off, spiritual hat comes off, and I would just lose my mind playing ball. And I remember one day being so frustrated and so sick of failing in that regard. I remember thinking, Lord, put me in that spot again, and I'm going to win this fight. I'm not going to let this one area be an area where I lash out at people and say ridiculous things. I remember vividly, Virginia Beach, Virginia, hot summer night, I'm playing ball. And I remember, you know, this one guy is talking to me. And in basketball games, you have a lot of great conversations. And this guy was talking to me. He's like, hey, God is for you, not against you. You know, God bless you. Philippians 4 over your life. And I was like, yeah, same to you. Only none of that was going on. <laughs> I remember this guy just talking and talking and talking. I remember trying to gauge. I'm like, I got to love people better. And instead of snapping back at this guy, I remember looking back at him. I'm like, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. You're great felt good. The rest of the game, we're going back and forth with each other, but I'm just giving love and he's giving hate. I'm giving love. He's giving hate. By the end of the game, he's so frustrated because all I would do is smile and say, it's all good. You're right. You're awesome. Whatever. That we lost the game, but I had never been more pumped. And I remember one of my friends is like, Carl, we lost the game. I'm like, yeah, man, but I'm winning this personal spiritual battle over here. You have no idea. It's amazing when you pick an area, pick an area of your life this week where it's hard for you to love. And say, Jesus, I need you here. Amazing when you start seeing the words of Jesus start impacting the, the, the steps of your walk with him. I'm going to give you another thing I like to do in 1 Corinthians. Can you go there with me real quick? I call this the love checkup. Who's interested to see how well you're loving people? Here's the marker. And I've got your Bible, Jen. I could feel the anointing on this thing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to preaching. Here's what the Bible says about love. This is fun. It's the love checkup. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love does not love evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's pretty powerful, but I'm going to read it to you in the personal conviction translation. You guys got to bring this up for me. I'm have, ready for this? You take out the word love and you put your name in it. Watch how convicting this is. Carl, oh, Carl is patient. Carl is kind. 
Carl does not envy. Carl does not boast. Carl's not proud. Carl does not dishonor others. Carl's not self-seeking. Carl's not easily angered. Carl keeps no records of wrong, even when they're... Okay, Carl always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres. Carl never fails. It's impossible, right? Unless you're outside the will of God. If you're in the will of God, walking with Jesus, the Bible says if you remain in me and I in you, we cannot be separated. So all of that leads you to one place, more of Jesus. So when you put yourself in there and you start reading, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not keep a record. The only way you can love people like Jesus, love them is if you know him better and better every single day. My prayer for an amazing church like this, your music's incredible. Y'all sing some of our stuff better than we do. Obviously, the teaching and the preaching in this house is spectacular, but what if Fresh Life was known for his love? If people were like, yeah, they're awesome, but they love people. We've been criticized in New York for loving people too much. Guilty. Someone's like, how can somebody like that call your church home? best music to a pastor's ears come on up here team we're gonna finish with this is this helping anybody in here i hope so always only jesus i wanted to give you something that you could uh do something with when you leave here we always say if if we're making people stand and clap on sunday but no one's moving on monday we're wasting our time so I pray that, yeah, you're getting this now, but I pray tomorrow that when you have, you're, you're in traffic, I don't know if you have traffic in Montana, maybe a cow crosses the road and you're mad or whatever. <laughs> when you would normally wave at someone in traffic, it's a different wave. When you're just about to hold that grudge again, go back to your time with Jesus where you remember what God did for you. There's no way you can hold it against them. Last little point, this is like one point. Only Jesus gives you your worth, and you should always, always remember that. Simple as it gets, only Jesus gives you your worth, so you should always, always remember that. I want you to hear me loud and clear, because I live in a city that, although there's different you know, factors that go into New York and Montana, the same thing is true about our country. We live in a society that gives you worth according to maybe what you do, or the things you've accumulated. Only Jesus looks at people and says, you have worth because I say so. Doesn't matter if you've lost your job. Doesn't matter if you've been humiliated. Doesn't matter if you have failure all around you. Only Jesus gives you your worth. And you should always, always remember that. Because there might come a moment where things change in your life. And if your worth is in anything other than Jesus, you're in trouble. But a Christian who gets everything they need from heaven and heaven alone can stand strong when everything else is shaky. And I'm going to give you a, a look into what I believe should be the confidence of every Christian. Last scripture, honestly. John 13, verse 21. And Jesus, again, is talking about him going to the cross, him dying eventually. And there's just a huge moment here where he drops a bomb. And in this moment you get maybe the identity of a, a follower of Jesus that we need to glean from. It says this, after he said all these things, Jesus was visibly upset. And then he told them, he said, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples looked around at one another, wondering who on earth was Jesus talking about? One of the disciples, the one Jesus loved dearly, was reclining against him with his head on his shoulder. Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus who he might be talking about. So being the closest, he said, Master, who? Just want to freeze for a moment and go back to this verse that says, one of the disciples, the one Jesus loved dearly, was reclining against them with his head on his shoulder. This is unbelievable, y'all. We have people that are afraid of God, that don't know their worth to the point where they're ashamed and even weird about coming to church. But here you have a disciple that was so content and so secure that he was literally chilling on the Savior of the world. To make matters even funnier, the guy who was like the one that Jesus loved the most, he wrote that about himself. Can you imagine having the kind of worth and esteem 
that is so supernatural that you describe yourself like this guy did as the one that Jesus loved? This is preposterous. Can you imagine showing up at work going, hey, I'm the one that Jesus loves. Can you imagine if you're single, if this, that was your Facebook profile? It's me, the one that Jesus loves. Can you imagine walking around? with the kind of confidence where you wake up in the morning tomorrow and despite all the sin, despite all the stuff you haven't conquered yet, where you wake up and you go, here I am again. I'm the one that Jesus loves. Woo! Can you imagine seeing Christians that can lose a job, lose somebody, have something go wrong, but they are so locked and loaded with the always only Jesus concept where nothing can move them except God himself. Do you have that in you, fresh life, to be able to get so close to Jesus that no matter what somebody else says, no matter what you see in the mirror, it does not change the reality that Jesus loves people so much that he wants to walk with you and he wants to talk with you and he will never leave you or forsake you. Do you have that kind of security? I pray that you do. Here's why. This voice from heaven, which is one of love, which is one of peace, If you can't hear it, there are a lot of other voices in our society that are going to tell you how to feel. So when you fail, if it's not Jesus giving you the voice, it's going to be your job. It's going to be some bad relationship. And to make matters even worse, we live in a fatherless society. So in Brooklyn, New York, for instance, 85% of young people are growing up without a father. Especially problematic with young women because psychologists will tell you a young girl gets 90% of her identity from the voice of her father. So now you put that on a heavenly level. If people don't have the voice of a father on this planet and they don't hear from the voice of the father from above, how in the world will people get their identity? Where are they going to get their worth from? MTV, culture, where you can never be enough, you can never do enough. So we have an entire generation settling for horrible things because they do not know what they're worth. You have Christians coming in and out of church and they've heard it from the pastor, but they haven't heard it from Jesus. So at the end of the day, there comes a point where there is a disconnection because they don't know any better. So you see people that are living lives they should never be living in relationships they should never have because they do not know what they are worth. I remember when this thing lit up for me, I went home to see some friends I haven't seen in a long time. And I got a call that said, hey, a couple of your high school friends are down at this restaurant slash bar, you know, go see him. If, if a bar frustrates you, it was a restaurant. If it doesn't, it was a bar. <laughs> and I remember walking into this place and uh, seeing people I haven't seen in like 12 years. And I, I sat down, I saw two friends from across the way and they saw me and they were like, Carl! And they ran over, I could tell that they were inebriated. They were drunk and high because people that are drunk just stumble, but people who are drunk and high, they kind of float like. <laughs> so they. <laughs> They floated over me and they were like, they were like, Carl, what happened to you, man? We're like, what, what's your, what happened? I mean, we heard that you became a priest. And I'm like, no, nah, not, not a priest. I'm definitely a Christian. And the one friend was so high or drunk where he could only repeat like every third word that my other friend was saying. So he's like, it's a priest. You know, and he would say sentences and he would repeat. And he was like, man, that's great. Good to hear what you're doing. But you know what we've been doing since we graduated from high school? You know what we've been doing, man? We've been living the dream. The other guy's like, just living the dream. So we have been living the dream. He's like, man, I've been committing crimes, living with criminals, haven't got caught once, living the dream. He said, I got so much money in my bank account, I don't even know what to do with it all. Just living the dream. He said, I, I know so many women. I could walk into any bar in this city and get you anybody you want. I'm just living the dream. I'm just living the dream. And I can feel the pain in his voice because anybody who has ever walked with Jesus for one second knows that life It is not the dream, it is a nightmare. But if people don't know they are worth more, if people don't know that God has called them to something better, we will continue to see people go down a road they should never go. It's gonna take churches like yours, people like you, to let people know God has called you to something greater. It's gotta start here before we ever take it to these streets. I'm gonna pray for you, but I wanna leave you with this. Can you remember this? Friend to friend sweating, yelling preacher to calm, sophisticated Christians. Seasons change, but the Savior's, Savior never does. Let me say it again so I get that right. I said Savior. It's like I believe in Buddha, Muhammad. <laughs> Seasons change, but the Savior never does. Remember this when you're in a season like your pastors walk through. 
Because we have a lot of Christians that are getting fooled by their season. Where if things are going good, they're good. But if things are going bad, they're going, where's God? He doesn't change in the bad season. He's still perfect. Don't look around your life and gauge how you're doing with Jesus because you see problems or you see challenge. In fact, if you don't see problems and you don't see challenge, you might want to check the pulse of your faith. But if we can be the kind of Christians that realize rain or shine, it's only Jesus. Win or lose, it's only Jesus. We are the only people that will literally exit a season in the middle of something bad. Nobody else does this in any other sphere of life. We realize that everything has its seasons. Like who doesn't love summer? I love summer until you sit in the car and you touch a steering wheel and you burn your hand. But no one just pieces out on summer. You're like, that's part of it. I mean, who loves fall? Fall is great. The air is awesome. You get to wear your cool sweater. You know, the leaves are falling, but it's a bummer to have to rake those leaves. But no one just hates fall. You realize it's a part of the journey. Who loves winter? I do. Winter's great until you're on a New York City subway and it's so cold, you wonder if there is a God. But people realize this is part of the journey. Who loves spring? I love spring. Spring is awesome. Until you get hit with so many allergies, you realize there is no medicine on planet Earth that can stop you from what's coming in this air. That's just part of the journey. Yet we have Christians that will go through something and forget that Jesus didn't change when you were sick. He's still the healer. Jesus didn't change when you felt empty. He's still the one you got to go to. Some of you need to hear it tonight. It might be raining on you, but Jesus is still your shelter. It might not look great, but he is still perfect. It might look like it's over, but it's not because Jesus never changes. Always only Jesus. Can I pray for you as we close? Every head bowed. Just want to pray for some amazing fresh lifers. If you are in a season where only Jesus, always only Jesus has been challenged. Maybe there's been a, a rainy season, a season of lack, a season of pain, and you've been tempted to start looking somewhere else. Maybe look to the right, took the left, and like God just kind of sent you an email from heaven tonight saying, it's only me. It's always me. It's always going to remain me. If you need that encouragement from heaven, just lift your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you that it's only you that we need to look for. It's only you that brings the life we need. It's only you that brings the hope that can change the whole world. So God, I pray for every hand lifted, every campus that might be watching right now. That Lord, wherever there are rainy seasons, Lord, you remind people that you don't leave us when it's bad. You're always perfect. You don't leave us when we fall down. You're always with us through and through. So God, I speak your name. I speak your favor. I speak your love over every person here, every person listening, Jesus. And we believe that your name will be lifted high above Montana and beyond, that in this world that is dying without you, Lord, let us be the people that continue to shine the light on the only name that matters. We give you praise for all you've already done. It gives us faith to believe you're going to do even more in the future. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, somebody shout amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special message from Pastor Carl Lentz. If during this message you realize that you'd like to give your life to Christ, you can do so at freshlifechurch.com by clicking the Know God link, and that'll send you to a page where you can register your decision for Christ. We'd love to send you a Bible free of charge just to help kickstart your relationship with Jesus. And if your life was impacted in any way by this message, we'd love to hear about it. So go to our website and just click Share Your Story. It's always so encouraging to hear all the stories of how our church is impacting people's lives. If you'd also like to support us financially, you can do so at our website. You can give one time or you can set up a reoccurring donation plan and uh, join us as we seek to see those stranded sin find life and liberty in Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching.